Warned also he was joining from home too, but he hasn't joined in yet. You know, I, I looked at so many different news for this. And, you know, we're just the, I don't know he's hasn't called in. Or, and warned all hasn't called in. Okay, we call the meeting to order. Get a motion on the agenda. Wait a second, by the only two here. All in favor? All right. Opposed, same sign. Minutes from previous meeting, you got a copy of what? Look, okay. Okay. Motion by Doug. Approve the minutes. Second. Bill says second. Okay, all in favor. I oppose any public comment. Public comment. Nothing from supervisors not seated or here. Mr. Administrator. Sure. Hi. Thanks, Chairman. A uh, couple of things I'll mention. First of all, you've probably been hearing a little bit about the ARP Act, which is the American Recovery and Prosperity Act. Uh, it basically is a municipal funding source. The counties will get it directly from the feds. I'm we're saying it's like a, a total of like 8.5 million, but it will be divided into two sections. The uh, there are some strings attached to it yet, but we don't have all those strings yet. So we are waiting for Department of Treasury to give us the information. What I can say is those funds are to be used um, either for COVID recovery specific type items, or uh, it is encouraged that they be used to support local economy. Regarding infrastructure, the only things that they are recommending or would probably limit us to would be things like water, sewer, and broadband. The county doesn't do those things specifically, but we are going to look at ways uh, that, you know, always, not just those three things. We're going to look at different ways to use that funding as we get more information. So I'll have more on that. And that's eight and a half million. Over yeah, it'd be like 4.2. This year and then up to four or four point two then within the next so many years. So uh, there will be no restrictions to how it's used. We'll have to be very careful to make sure that it's all approved. <clears throat> but we will be looking at that. Um, one thing that may actually, or one thing we are going to be doing that you might be interested in is we did hire a firm or contract with a firm. We are actually moving forward with our website introduction and, and getting a new website purpose being to communicate uh, better to the public, uh, provide services to the public. Ours is long outdated, but we are moving on that. More friendly now. Yeah, People absolutely. Like uh, in terms of uh, buildings, I know you've heard, I'm sure, but the A&E uh, portion of the uh, uh, mechanical and possible remodeling of portions of this building uh, has been undertaken and I think Thursday LHB the company uh, chosen will be presenting a timeline to general government so you may want to check into that to see what the timeline is as we move forward on that this year uh, I'll also mention that the parks department <clears throat> has been uh, refreshed so to speak uh, after the sale of lime quarry and, and Mo and his team Rod have been working hard and we are underway we are making significant progress plans to improve our parks and trails within the county. And I think this is, we'll have more updates on that as we get uh, things completed. That's all I have. Oh, COVID. Yeah. You may have seen that the uh, Supreme Court of Wisconsin did in fact overturn the governor's um, emergency order. Here in the county, uh, while it is not required that people uh, continue to follow his uh, those instructions, including the mask. We are strongly encouraging it, especially when you're in a room where you're within six feet of work. Okay, very good. Any questions? Leo, do you have any questions? <laughs> okay. Supervisor Bonham Price, are you on the phone? Supervisor Warndall, is that you? Yes. You catch all that, Steve? Yeah, I got it all. 
It's good enough. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, well, unfortunately. Oh, <laughs> all right. Just go ahead then. <laughs> Update on the highway. Norby, what have you got? Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, I got a few things for you. I handed out a packet. Um, from last committee meetings, uh, Mr. Bonderprise asked a question about 243 bridge. Is it still on schedule? Um, and it is still on schedule for 2025, 2026. So that project is a Minnesota project and it's still on schedule. Um, FYI information, uh, Buffalo County Highway Department lost a foreman on the job, was um, struck by a fallen tree. Um, subsequently passed a week later, a couple days later on there. Um, Next year, the state has negotiated. We have a 3% increase in the cost of salt for 21, 22 winter. That's going to be about a $17,000 increase from last year's budget for us. With that, and um, a safety project, County Road F is in the federal program now from Amory to Duranda. I asked the engineers to look at that intersection of F and double P there in Duranda for some safety options and see what we could do to that intersection to make it safer, whether it's a one-way stop, two-way stop, four-way stop, um, and get that added onto that project. I'm looking at adding it into that project with additional funding uh, to, see, to fix that area up also. So that'll be coming um, totally with that. Um, in the packet I handed out, the first cover page here is uh, Governor Ebert's the Declaration for National Work Zone Awareness Week. Uh, which will be April 26th through the 30th. Um, we'll run this ad in the paper also to let everyone know that. It's a very important uh, problem for us is, is work zone safety. Uh, State Patrol there down on Highway 8 last week or the week before, it caught three individuals in that 45 zone uh, going past our patching crew at 65 miles an hour plus. You know, so the enforcement is needed out there also um, and following up on that. So. You'll see more on that coming out and there'll be some more releases from the WCHA on that one. Uh, the next one in your packet there is the state uh, Highway 65 rehabilitation project. This one here gives kind of the details oh, of what they plan on it. And I did also attach the news release and the links to that, that you could go on there and look at the project site for you. And that's scheduled for 2024 with the anticipation that will be uh, moved forward to 2023 for construction. The downside of this, there's only two areas for reconstruction down by 38th Avenue and in the belly tickler area there north of the South Sea Junction. And other than that, there is no plant inspection for the hills just south of the um, South Sea so Currently, that's all it's going to for reconstruction of this. Coaster South of that right now. And they're going to take a bunch of trees out there on Church Road. Make a mistake. They are staying within the right of way and not doing much with the uh, no no plans for that intersection at Church Road for widening vision or anything. Yeah. But there is a, a link on there for public input. I'd encourage you to go on there and as a supervisor and I emailed many times all these conditions, um, but it helped for um, you also to get on there and to voice that. The next part of your uh, topic is one that I'll be go going to the Towns Association meeting with. I was asked to put together what our project lists are for 2021. Um, with that is the front cover is just the, our, our projects and our CIP we're doing, kind of our basic ones. The next, the next page shows a map of those projects and where they're listed. The following one is our striping schedule for this year for 2021. So you can see where our line striping is gonna be if people have questions for you on that. The next page is the state program, what's being done with our state program highways and what year they fall in currently. As you know, Amory is under construction right now for that safety project um, with a long detour around there. Then the last page is kind of a, right now is our rough schedule, schedule for our projects for 2021, where they're lining up currently. Go after this car. Some of these are kind of tentative right now. We open bids uh, next Wednesday on our uh, milling and paving 
So once we get those firmed up, then we can confirm those dates. But I did add on here our federal projects that are in the queue right now, three bridges for replacement this year, one for next year, and then uh, three more uh, the next uh, couple years after that in the 23 cycle. So those are in, in progress right now. At the top is, um, is uh, the fairgrounds museum facilities projects also for this year and where we have a penalty scheduled out for uh, replacement on that. And then coming up in May is National Public Works Week. Uh, their motto for uh, the association is stronger together. And it kind of ties in with their poster here. It actually has, you know, the recycling, it has road construction, it has the salt trucks, and it also has vaccination clinics that's currently running through the facility right now. So kind of a nice poster will be up um, with these around the buildings. And that's all I have for an update. Oh, and then also real shortly, um, at general government, I'll be going with the, um, the honorable chairman from Lincoln Township is, um, is asking for um, right away on County Road C down there by uh, Nikki Jost. Uh, to transfer some right away there just to uh, install a fire truck garage, correct? It'll be a substation, hopefully. Substation. Yeah, That'll be going to general government. It's a bad spot out there that requires uh, uh, just kind of no man's land fire department. Right. Good location for a substation. Right. Correct. That'll, that'll be out there. And then I will, for Supervisor Bonaprise and Warren Dahl, put this packet in your mailbox. So that'd be the same as like it is at uh, all of Chairman okay. Luke, I did hear the whole presentation. And uh, if they could have put my packet in my uh, 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 room there, you know, in our uh, mail slot, I'll pick it up on Thursday. Will do. That's no problem. We'll take care of that for you, Johnny. We couldn't hand deliver if you need it. Where are you? <laughs> oh, never mind. All right. Are you answering? Anything else? Does anybody else have any questions for Mo? Be non thanks, Mo. Appreciate it. Here's Mo. Turn it down a little. That's really good news to share today. I'm passing around a press release I got to put out yesterday. Uh, one of my deputies, Andrew Vitalis, is going to receive the National Sheriff's Association's Deputy Sheriff of the Year for Merit, uh, which is a nationwide national recognized award. Um, he will receive this award in June out in Phoenix, Arizona at the National Sheriff's Conference. Um, Andrew is recognized for the work he did on the cold case hit and run Turn that uh, halfway. Couple homicides. So anyway, uh, for a small county like Polk to get national recognition is, is just an awesome thing for us. And it really is a testament to the staff that I have over there, the hard work they do. And, you know, I often say law enforcement is quick to get criticized when we screw up and we're often slow to recognize good work. So I'm really excited to share the news. So um, it's a big feather in our cap and Andrew will be the first one to say that. It is a total team effort and you know he's just part of a team but at the end of the day he came up with the idea to pitch this to make this video he pitched the idea and ultimately we did that and you know we shared the cost of that with the st croix tribal police so to partner up with st croix tribal police and work to solve this case for the community is a fantastic fantastic thing so um that's really a chance to brag today and, and share that good news so um if we could get a copy of this too and john's packet that, that would be great and then the other thing I want to say is this Sunday starts the National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week and that is where we honor dispatch for the week and we always have a cake and celebration and we recognize the hard work that our dispatch center does so we look forward to that celebration and then I will also like to mention that uh, next Wednesday on the 14th we uh, honor Mike Severson that's his end of watch date that's the day that Mike passed away so uh, we'll be sharing some information next week about Mike and the legacy that he left behind. That's all I have for you. I have some drug stat numbers if you guys are interested. Um, 
these will be the, the first quarter of the year here. So January through March here. Um, we did a total of 175 drug cases in three months. Uh, that included 88 felony arrests, 73 misdemeanor arrests. We seized almost uh, 956 grams of methamphetamine, five guns, and $6,500 in cash. So, still uptick in drug activity. A large, large amount of this is going to be due to um, stimulus money coming out too. They're they're using that to buy drugs, and so we're going to see obviously an uptick in drug activity. Um, today we brought in Ty Hansen, our recreation deputy, to introduce you to him. Um, he's working with the ad hoc group, and he's our full-time rec deputy in charge of a boat, ATV, snowmobile, anything rec-related. So I'll go ahead and tell him just a little bit about himself. Sure. Hi, um, I'm Ty Hansen. I've been with the sheriff's office since 2016. Um, Recently took the position for the full-time rec deputy. So like Chief Deputy said, I'll be doing full-time boat, ATV, UTV, snowmobile for the considerable future. Uh, we have a new boat on the way. It should be here sometime mid-summer. Looking forward to getting some new trails in the county, helping enforce some hours and getting more people. Any questions for me? Let me go to Johnny. Anybody got any questions? Steve? No, I'm good. Okay. Uh, Chairman Luke, uh, was there some money put away for a scholarship in the honor of Mike Deberson? Do you know anything about that? I seem to recollect that. There is a committee of sheriff's deputies that are put together, and I should say sheriff's department staff. They do have a scholarship program that they do on their own. It's not a part of the Sheriff's Department of County, it's a separate entity. Thank you much. All right. Any other questions? I don't have anything else. If anybody else has any questions. So long? Anytime. <laughs> you got to bring sunscreen if you're going out in the boat, though. Well, it's a good word, guys. Okay, thank you. Now, let's see. Go ahead, Doug. This is for the sheriff. I, my wife pulled this up on her local news phone last night. It's just fantastic. Yeah, it, it really is. I mean, to get national recognition is yeah. a testament to the hard work the staff has done over there, and it's it's a great thing. So, yeah, we're, we were really proud of good it. Good to share this news. What an achievement. Yeah, well, I, that's great. I, hard, to, hard to believe, actually. What have we got for CJCC? All right, so continuing on with the philosophy that we're keeping the committees updated on priorities one and two, priority one being substance abuse and reduction, priority two being public safety. You know, we've gone around to each committee and we've got representing on the disciplines related to the committee. Last month, you guys heard from the sheriff's office. Uh, next week, Health and Human Services hears from Community Service Division regarding behavioral health and child and family services. Uh, in May, I'm going to do a presentation to general government on that asset or the resources expended. And then in June, we do executive committee overall. But what I'm going to show you today is a presentation regarding CJCC and the meth trends in the county, what CJCC does, the purpose of the formation of it, and how it can help with it. I want to start off, though, by saying, you know, when we think of CJCC, you got to think of much more of a systemic thing than just the three people that work for the county in DOA. So, so we're going to cover what makes up Polk County CJCC, meth, what it is and how it works. Meth is an epidemiological factor. Meth and crime approaches the meth problem and how you can help. We're going to do this in about 10 minutes. So we're using the Chris Nelson. All right. But the important thing with CJCC is it is not the two treatment case managers and the CJCC coordinator that make up CJCC. It is all these things here. It's the, the staff within Polk County government, whether it's community services, sheriff's office, CJCC staff, or Department of Administration. 
It's the other government agencies, the DA's office, the judiciary, the courts, probation and parole, public defender, UW Extension, tribal, and it's those non-governmental organizations, Mental Health Task Force, United Way. And I got to be honest, this, as much as I would like to say is the, the biggest part in it, this is probably the smallest piece of the system in order for it to work. Here and here are the two key things in order to make CJCC work. When you agreed on. So methamphetamine is part of a methamphetamine class of drugs. So just real brief overview. Methamphetamine came into being during late World War One, early World War Two. It was developed by the Germans to actually keep troops awake and things like that, pre-Nazi. And then in the 50s and 60s, it was actually marketed as a diet pill, heavily used, especially in suburban America. It wasn't outlawed until, I think, 73 when we created the Controlled Substance Control Act. And then they outlawed methamphetamine. There's two different. There's methamphetamine that's artificially produced. There's amphetamine. There's the, that's the pharmaceutical grade. That's Adderall. Uh, even a, a soma is a type of amphetamine. There's amphetamines and several things. So there's still prescriptions. Uh, treats ADHD, treats depression, treats a number of things. So it has a legitimate use. Um, intensifies pleasure and happiness. Uppers, it increases your activity level. Reduces hunger. As I said, in the 50s and 60s, it was a big diet pill. You could pretty much buy amphetamine pills from any doctor in any pharmacy in America. Oh, highly, highly addictive, though. And that's why it got put on the Controlled Substances Act. It's a Schedule One, and it's highly, highly addictive. It's only up there with LSD and cocaine, and it's addiction. Um, and it's illegal without a prescription. All methamphetamine is illegal. Amphetamine is illegal without a prescription. All right. It's the pleasure centers, release of dopamine. The dopamine is that thing that makes you feel great. It's like the first time you feel fall in love, that you can't get enough of being with whoever you fell in love with, same thing. It does that to your receptors. Take it away, you, you feel like you can't live without it. Very intense high. The difference is the high lasts a lot longer. Crack cocaine, you know, there was a lot of crack where I came up. Crack cocaine, very short highs. You bought it three or four times a day. Methamphetamine, honestly, you can go a couple, three days on one day. Very high craving for methamphetamine. You know, you just want meth. Highly addictive, and it may result in binging. So you go and you go and you go and you go and you go on it, and then you start feeling down, and then they take Xanax, and then they take you know, Klonopin, and then they take others to help that depressive feeling that hits after, and then they crash for days, and then they go back up and they set up. Physical. So meth mouth is the one everybody knows. Uh, it's because the nutrients, the calcium, uh, the deoxidation in your teeth creates meth mouth. You also see a lot of weight loss, uh, sunken eyes, um, uh, veins, you know, become very protrusive, neurological, psychological, so psychosis, severe agitation, and addiction. Psychosis can be the first time you use it, and usually you see the worst psychosis in the first or early use. After a while, the addiction sets in the psychosis. Uh, severe agitation, that's the emotional instability that comes with it. Um, you can go from zero to 60. You know, somebody on meth, you know, you say one word to a wrong and they can fly off. Right. So this is the timeline for your withdrawal and relapse risk. What's important about this is Opiates, highly addictive, got a more compressed timeline to come off of it. You get it out of your system, you come off cold, you separate yourself from it. You know, you have a little more success there. Alcohol, as long as you can stay off alcohol, you know, a 90 day program will work. Um, you know, as long as you keep your, you go to AA, those kind of things. Methamphetamine, that urge is consistent for so long. Because it's so deeply rooted in your chemical makeup in your brain. With, with the receptors changing in your brain, the dopamine, the lack thereof. So the key to this, and here's where CJCC comes in. You put somebody in jail for a week, you're going to do them no good 
they go right back out to their environment. You put them in jail for 10 weeks, you're still at the high level. They're going to go right back out and use it. Six months is still significant. So we're six months in, and there is still a significant physical and psychological addiction. That they have. You find this in very, very, very few drugs. A crack you can recover from in 90 days and come off of it. Methamphetamine, six months is still high. Diminishing a year plus. This is where the CJCC comes in. How do we treat it? We have to go after the offenders. There's always going to be a place for law enforcement. We have to confine to separate them in the short term. Now, what do we do after that short term confinement? How do we make sure they stay off? One of the most successful programs I ever saw in my life was a place called the Foundry in Birmingham. And they would get out of jail. They'd go into the foundry. It was like intensive. I think it was 180 day intensive inpatient treatment. Then they moved to foundry sober living where they lived in apartments. They were monitored. They went out to work, came in. That was like nine months. And then they moved out to foundry houses where they had outpatient therapy, but they still had the support. And it was like a two year program for success. And the other key to the foundry was. If you were from Birmingham, you didn't go from the, to the foundry. If you were from Mobile, four hours south, you might go. have to remove them from the environment. So that's where CJCC comes in and all the user groups. We've got law enforcement to deal with the immediate threat, to deal with the users, to get them separated from it, to deal with the dealers, to cut off the supply. You've got corrections and judiciary to impose sentences and the morals of society. But then how do we treat them? We treat them with aftercare. We treat them with intensive therapy. We treat them with outpatient therapy. We treat them with, you know, psychosocial support, how to get going with life, how to get a job, how to apply for a job, how to get their GED, how to go grocery shopping with their kids, how to run a budget, all those kinds of things. And then we continue the aftercare, which, you know, Don and Susan and I have talked a lot real struggle we still have now is aftercare. How do we get aftercare better? And, you know, it's a constant discussion at CJCC. Probation and parole, same issue they face. How do we make aftercare better? How do we get, getting pretty good at this point. We have some work to do at this point, and that really has to do with that judiciary opponent there, you know, and that's really where judiciary comes in. How do we deal with this? And that's where all those extra agencies, those community groups, behavioral health, those kind of places come in. You know, the long term thing. That's why treatment court is so long. You know, mm -hmm. treatment court is so long because we want to get them past this. The hope is when they graduate, they stay off. But even past here, there's something that's missing, and that's for the rest of their lives, what kind of support do they have in the community? And you get that urge to go back or you hit a stressful time in your life or you become unemployed, what kind of support is there? Do you have classes you can go to? Do you have treatment you can go into? What kind of things do you have? So the, the impacts on community, child neglect, separation from parents and caregivers. So I've never busted a meth house where they didn't cry in the back of my patrol unit on the way to jail saying, you can't take me to jail, I gotta take care of my kids. I've never busted a meth house where the kids had a clean environment. So the kids suffer significantly. You know, separation from parents and caregivers, there's damage that's done to a kid there, but there's also damage done to living in that environment. So how do we deal with that? That creates multi-generational addiction. You know, if you saw your parents work hard, earn a living, buy a house, you know, raise their family, go to church every day, that becomes your norm in your social morale. But if you see your parents engaging in deleterious behavior, meth use, selling, crime, that starts to become your norm. And so you get that multi generational thing going on. Economy, so you got to get a drug test to get a job. You can't pass a drug test, you can't get a job. So that unemployment reduced. Increased money for prevention, enforcement, treatment. We've talked a lot about that, about how much money we're putting into fighting methamphetamine. But it's so much more than that. The, the cost is immeasurable on what methamphetamine and what drugs as a whole cost. 
right? You can't really put, you know, everybody likes to talk about how expensive the drug war of the 80s and 90s and early 2000s were. It's so expensive in so many ways because what would America be now if it would have, wouldn't have started in the 80s and the cocaine? We took that piece out. How far ahead would this country be at this point? Um, environmental meth head or meth houses, we've talked about that. Not as much as it used to be in the days of labs where we had $400,000 cleanups and where houses were condemned and we had to scrape two feet of dirt off the lot, and all that kind of stuff by EPA standards. Now it's ice, so it's a little different, but you still have substandard living hazards type of houses. You still have the nuisances in the neighborhood. I see three supervisors in this room that I've talked to repeatedly about the nuisance in their houses and those meth houses. And then contact kids can be exposed skin to skin contact. So, you know, babies that are in the womb get addicted. Children that breathe the environment get addicted. Second hand from methamphetamine smoking is a very real thing. And then social, you know, reputational harm produced cohesion. So, you know, uh, once a method, always a method. And, you know, that's a stigma that attaches to you. So even if you get people past the treatment, you know, if they've got that notoriety in their community, that's very, very hard for them to shake. And it's kind of like, well, you're a method. Now I was, I recovered. Well, I'm not giving you a chance. Those things cause problems. That's again, those outside groups are important in creating those avenues. And Don, please jump in at it. And then increased crime. So there's no good metrics anywhere in this country to say the crime is up by this percentage because of drug use, or crime is up by this percentage specifically because of methamphetamine. But we know it is because we know how many offenders have underlying methamphetamine problems and drug problems. We know it is because we know how much theft occurs in order to buy drugs. You know, as the chief deputy mentioned, stimulus money to buy drugs. You know, that's so we know that crime leads to that because crime is motivated by passion. Motivated by money. That's where crime comes from. So the different crimes, possession, meth is a felony, so we're in heroin, cocaine, use that felony level. Alcohol, first OWI of civil offense. And we're talking about substance abuse. We're talking about methamphetamine. We're talking about cocaine. We're talking about opiates. We're talking about alcohol. And we can't honestly have a discussion about substance abuse and prevention unless we talk about that. Marijuana, first possession is a misdemeanor. That's a dying number right there. Because in many states, it's now decriminalized or legal. Why is meth such a problem? Stimulant property. Just can't live without it. Once you get on it, you just can't. You'll meet a lot of people if you work dope, especially. I mean, a lot of people will say, yeah, I've got LSD once or twice. You know, I, I tried crack once. I did cocaine a little bit, but it was never a habit. But you'll almost never meet anybody that did methamphetamine once or twice. It's just so addictive. So um, then meth-related other criminal activity, property crime to violent crime. And that goes to the need to be able to buy your meth to the emotional outbreaks that we talked about earlier on. Is that's where the violent crime comes from? Is you know, the sudden fits of rage and terror and psychosis. So, this was an interesting graph that the group came up with. The average age of first use so, blue is alcohol, orange, marijuana, uh, silver is opioid, green is stimulant, methamphetamine falls into stimulant. Um, and you see the average age, but you know, I, I'm going to be honest. You can, there are people who will say, no, these are gateways. Those are gateways, and you see at what age they, they really start. And they're gateways because you slowly, so whether it's cool or you're trying to escape as a teenager, you drink a little alcohol or smoke some weed, and then it's not enough for you, and you need something strong. And that's the progressive gateway. So these are the numbers of first users by age range. This is first time use. This is a horrific number 
that needs to be focused on. And as we talk about CJCC and services and all that, that's an area we hope grows is addressing that issue. How do we preempt this? Stuff? How do we preempt the alcohol use? How do we preempt the marijuana use? How do we preempt the methamphetamine use? It doesn't really happen. Everybody likes to say everybody experiments when they go to college. That's not where it really happens. They happen. And that that is really the area we've got to target. But the other important takeaway way is if we target this 24 and under, and if we address our program for that age range, we can really be impactful. You know, if they're getting to the 35 to 45 range and they're still a hardcore user, and my CJCC staff would probably cringe at me saying this, but from my experience, you're not going to have tons of you're going to have success early on. So you try those different methods, and that's what we're looking for. Is new methods. So these are drug arrests, just the sheriff's office, um, 2017, 2018, 2019. So again, you've got alcohol, marijuana, opioids, synthetics, which is where methamphetamine falls. And most of the synthetic classified arrests in Polk County are going to be methamphetamine. So alcohol, predominant number of arrests by long shot. Uh, marijuana, opioids, you see we've had a very low baseline on opioid arrests. And synthetics, you can see that. And I'll do that. This is just the sheriff's office. So you know we're we're working on getting better data for the county as a whole. This is also through 2019 because we uniform crime reporting is only through 2019, right? So <laughs> So prevention, the drug-free communities grant, which we just got, which I'll be the first to tell you, I know just enough about it to be dangerous. So if Don wants to give a little more on that, I might you too right now. Can you tell a little bit about that, Don? I can. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity. By the way, I'm Don Wortham. I work with UW Extension. Uh, for the last nine months, I've been associated with the uh, CJCC. Uh, I've also done a lot of work with Polk United, which we'll discuss in a second, but that drug-free communities grant is an opportunity to uh, impact uh, those youth that Chad was talking about just a moment ago in a positive way with uh, positive messages about things that you should do, negative messages about things that you shouldn't do. Right, so that was a question. Uh, it's focused on youth uh, and a lot of the effort in the past uh, for these programs has gone toward uh, tobacco and alcohol and we're looking for a way to mold this grant to also help with uh, with methamphetamines. So that's just kicking off this year and we think it's a great opportunity for the county. And it's a very big win for the county getting this one. It's a big deal. And you want to touch on Polk United, Don? I'd be happy to. So Polk United is, uh, I think we lost the slide though. Uh, that's okay. So Polk United is the county's healthcare coalition. We do everything from do the countywide needs assessment with our three healthcare providers in the county uh, to setting up uh, uh, prevention activities to keep folks uh, uh, healthy. Uh, our three focus areas for the three-year cycle are substance abuse, so that's perfectly in line with the, with the Board of Supervisors' uh, priorities. Uh, also, uh, mental health, and Chad hasn't, uh, I, I think it was indicated somewhere in this presentation that uh, mental health often is uh, it's a co-occurrence with substance abuse, so that's the focus of Polk, of Polk United. I don't know if we got it to it in the deck yet. Um, and then the third area is nutrition, physical activity, trying to work on obesity in the county. That's what Polk United is focused on. Uh, but one of those three work groups is really uh, specifically targeting uh, substance abuse. And with the interest in methamphetamines, that will be a top priority for Polk United in the coming years. And then on mental health, you know, the other thing to keep in mind is the national figures 40 to 42 percent of all people confined in U.S. jails suffer from some kind of mental health disorder and are on some kind of psychotropic treatment. So there's there's very close ties between criminality and mental health. Um, enforcement, the DCF and sheriff's office are enforcement arms. You know, probation and parole is an enforcement arm. Uh, I think they all work very well together. They have the Drug and Danger Child Program, which I know the sheriff is impassioned about. And that they've really been working on kind of with renewed effort lately. Um, and treatment. So you've got in jail, 
know, this is something we're we're moving towards is we want to provide treatment when they're in our jail. How do we get them mental health treatment? How do we get them substance abuse treatment while they're confined? You now that was, you know, early on, Sheriff Walk and I talked about that. It's really frustrating to walk through the jail and see people just riding out their time sitting on their hands. So that's been a major push is to expand that to get in early so that in that six week window, when you've got them in jail, you can start to affect that one year window. So we made a lot of strides with that. The program service officers, large stride. You know, having the GED program in the jail for the first time is a large stride. I, I know they're working on tablets, you know, to help provide some educational resources in jail. COVID has put a big hindrance on these programs, but they've still managed a lot. Diversion, that's our TAD grant, and that's our treatment. So these people get locked up. You know, how do we keep them from getting locked up again? The other thing with diversion is how do we keep them from ever getting locked up in the first place? How do we divert their actions early on so they don't wind up in our first? That's a big focus of TJCC. We have a diversion case treatment coordinator who was hired last year specifically to beef that program up so that we start diverting some of these criminal acts and this behavior. And then aftercare, I'm going to say it time and time again because I believe a big, glaring, in what we have right now and, are, and something we really have to work on. For those not in this system, behavioral health, um, CCS, and again, aftercare. Aftercare is a common thread. Doesn't matter if we get them because of their mental health, at least their substance abuse, or because we get them because of their substance abuse, at least their criminality. In the end, it's aftercare that keeps them from reoffending, which is what we want. You know, we got to stop the reoffenders. Otherwise, you can't ever stop them. So, this is the recovery model pre use, meth use. Ideally, you want to get in early on the meth use. We would like it to be where we're interceding between meth use and arrest, where we're truly diverting. And really, we would like that, you know, that's where we need to target the zero to 24 age gap, get them before arrest. Cop goes out, we have diversion programs in place where the cop has a choice between locking them up or saying, look, you can go behind bars or you can get help. I'll help you get there. Because no cop wants to lock a 17 year old up. It just doesn't happen. We just want to end the crime, stop the threat, and make it better. Excuse me, today I'm no longer a cop. Um, incarceration for diversion and treatment, aftercare, disability. As you see, we either stop it between before arrest or we help them in aftercare. Those are the two areas we really have to focus on. These are what we presently offer. For alcohol, we have a first time offender program that's really taken off this year, even with COVID. I'm very proud, and Julie, our diversion case coordinator, has done a really good job getting that off. Um, marijuana, our FTO program, first time offender, is designed for that too. We're starting to get more participation in the Alcohol for a peer. We have the IDIP program, which was housed in community services. We've since shifted that to TJCC oversight, and it seems to be doing pretty well. I think we've made a lot of good steps. Don's been instrumental in helping us with that. And, been... and then TAD and treatment court, you know, our diversion and treatment court, which are existing programs. You know, we don't we don't have anything in place for opioids. And CJCC. But from the arrest data, opioids is not what our problem is. Our problem is stimulants and alcohol. Right now, our model for CJCC is to perfect what we've got, work on what we got before we expand. And we, we think that's the best model to go forward. All right. So, it's a coordinated effort is schools, law enforcement, it's corrections, it's judiciary, it's community services and in civic wards and churches. And really those last two, in my opinion, are just so vitally important. They really are. This is how you guys can help, because that's always the question. What can we as supervisors do to help? So you can lobby for the proposal to extend Badger Care to incarcerated persons. You know, Badger Care is our, our Medicaid program. You know, temporarily suspended under COVID rules, but normally when somebody enters jail, Badger care stops. 
Well, two things happen with that. Number one, they're denied a certain set of services because they're not basic necessary emergency services. Um, number two, it costs the county a whole lot more money because we're either recovering that from private insurance, the hospitals are eating because we're paying the bills. So the extension of badger care permanently to incarcerated individuals is important, both from a fiscal standpoint and from a recovery standpoint. Mental health substance abuse treatment options in or near Polk County. We've talked about this before, but deputies drive all the way to Winnebago with a chapter most of the day. You know, you're talking about a 10 hour trip to take somebody who's coming down off an excited delirium who needs treatment and that kind of stuff. We need resources close by. That only comes through lobbying efforts, through getting money appropriated for these. All right. Support the diversion programs, which you guys have done an excellent job of. We we can't complain. The support for CJCC has been phenomenal. Uh, the jail reentry to society program includes treatment options. Again, the things we're working for. And then the aftercare programs. That's where the continued support for the county, both philosophically and financially, will be important. And then communicate to constituents. You know, when they say, what are you doing about methamphetamine? We want to give you guys the information so you can tell them. And when budget time comes around, we want you guys to have the information. So when we come with the asks, you guys can weigh what you need to appropriate. And then how substance abusers can seek help before the situation gets worse. That's another aspect of kind of this educational thing that the chair wanted to keep you guys updated so you know what we have now. You know the available. Any questions? Um, two points that you hit on that really hits reality. And one is that even though you're off of the drugs, it's your past habits that still get you in trouble, like lying and stuff. Because CJCC will, you know, if you keep doing it, they'll kick you out. And the other is, is the kids, they, we have two of them for full custody right now, and they're 14 and 7. And you could tell the environment they come by. Because I, I mean, the houses, like you said, you walk in and it's, and the wife struggles with that all the time. Well, you know, methamphetamine abuse, heroin abuse, cocaine abuse is not an act, it's a behavior. And behavior has to change. Mm -hmm. And it's just not the behavior of using it, it's the things that lead up. So going to the line, it's behavioral change, which is where behavioral health mm -hmm. and the system support comes into play. So I mean it's very true. You have to remove the behavior and the environment that led to that behavior for it to go easy. And then kids, it's a multi-generational thing. The drug war started in 1973 when Nixon created the Controlled Substance Act and formed the DEA. And we are what 48 years later and we're still in the drug war because it's multi-generation i mean it, it, it passes on you got to cut it off at some point we really in the cjcc honestly believe that cut off is that early intervention that 17 and old and younger is where we really think the biggest thing is these houses they get sent to uh the one like in uh lacrosse or eau claire um they were fantastic. Sure. Yep. But you see, once again, you're moving them from their yeah. environment. And that's kind of the example I gave. It's that aftercare and that change. Yeah. All right, guys, if nothing else, that's my uh, spiel. Okay. Well done. Thank you very, very much. That was great. Okay. Supervisor Rowdy. You have an ATV, UTV update? I, have I do. And the first part of my update is frustration. We're being pressured all the time to have PTAG takeovers. If you look here in the room, had to go home. We have the most fantastic committee you could put together. And we're, we're one area, ATV, UTV. And these guys, all as knowledgeable as you can get on all the aspects of it, the club members, they're going to do the work try and get these trails open, and yet we're being pressured into saying this other committee should do it. So I just want uh, that I just want that out there. I, I could let it go because as a committee, we stood up 
and said, no, this group should be working on this. And they're the group that are involved. So they wanted PTAG to take over this biggest loop, which is the 25 mile loop that we've been working on. And we said, well, the club's going to do all the work on it, these fellows. So they should really be doing it. So anyway, I'm moving on. What we want to do with this 25 mile is technically do sections of it because 25 miles is a pretty big project. So if you can make it into, they're going to work on the section, but four sections, five sections. And if you create that section, let's say the first section and come out to the town road, then that goes down and ends up just about on the land. So if they create that, that becomes one that they can project hopefully out to get some state funding in the future. So because Ben said each uh, an ATV, UTV has to be a loop. Where a snowmobile doesn't, they, they Danny was saying they create trails and but the, the ATV, UTVs are different, but we're working with the town roads Hopefully we can always get back to the landing on each one of these sections that will be completed. And then a lot of the, the uh, Mark was here, Forrester, and a lot of these sections are forest roads. And you get less return of, I think he said 50% uh, uh, for the state funding for those, or because they're already a created uh, forest road. But they're easier to create because you can mow them with a brush mower, get the brush out, and then grade them and hold it quick. So, but those tie into is that right? Those tie into the parts that they have to actually make. And then this would be a if they want to follow whatever you ate, whatever I don't know what they call it, but they have to create a, a twelve foot ride for it. Two way, two way ride, 12 foot here, eight, eight feet to ride on and 12 feet. So they're, they're anticipating working that. That's why to have a two way, two -way ride, which is, I call it fantastic. Yeah, so that's really what they're working on. And they're close enough to the start that they're going to work with Mark and go out and look and see when they can get. Things progress. Okay. Um, have we got information like you got in your hand? That I haven't. Uh, I'm not, I don't have a copy of that. But you have information like this available to to club members and. Yes, they all have a map, okay. and Ben can create more if, if you'd like to have them. I've, That's just what he brought us for today. I think we should make them. Available to all the club people, and you'll find people. Very they, they can. The, this red loop over here, yeah. that's the five mile. Landing is up right about in, right about there. So you, if you make this first loop, you would come over to here, then you can ride town roads all the way down back to the landing. Or you can. Oh, this is evergreen. This is evergreen. Yeah. Well, we should study this up a little bit. I see what you got. Yeah, that's what I'm. Uh, I think that you'll find some people that are interested in getting up there and helping. And all that. Oh, that is fantastic. Yeah, I know it's some good. people that are just waiting for more information. I think. Oh. Yeah, that just came out today, so that's as far as I. Uh, you know, your concerns about other, I talked, had a good conversation with Vince in reference to that. And I think you know, we pretty much concluded that there is, that the ATV, UTV uh, group is the group that's, that's got the heavy oil and water for this thing. Uh, yeah, and, and without being in those meetings, the, the challenge is, is the, the themes that the Board of Supervisors has passed conflicting uh, paths. 
Right. You have a PTAG committee, which is designed to look at, take a look at the overall trail network and, and the activities, recreational activities. Right. And then you have an ATV, UTV group that's looking specifically, which is great. Now, if those two can communicate well and coordinate, but keep in mind what's going to happen is every group in the county with a fat bike, fat tire bicyclists, the cross country skiers, the, you know, whatever, will all say, hey, we got to come up with our group and start developing it, which is fine. We want people to have input, but how do you coordinate that in a way that you have, which is the purpose of PTAG, a comprehensive picture of the county? So that it doesn't become a, an arms race, so to speak, of like, we want this part first, and we want that. I think what what you're seeing with the ATV UTV group is a group of people who come up with very good ideas based on common sense and practical solutions. Okay. So, so that's why I'm, I'm just encouraging communication between the two groups. Yeah, go ahead. Though. Well, Mr. Administrator, I understand you're talking about and PTAG being the overall, they're going to work with this consultant. But I was told today that PTAG wants to take over the 25 miles. Well, that's that's mixed. Uh, not the management you're talking about. And who spoke? Who said PTAG wants to think oh, somebody of somebody did? Or who? Someone here in the county. I don't want to say names. I, well, it's Bob Kazmersky. He said that he, I went to his office and he, he said they, we should, we could do some sections of this, but he wants PTAG to run the 25 miles. Well, we're the group that's working on this with, they might be, as you say, each one wants to take over, but you have to have someone that understands what the project is to do it. Yeah. So I, I well, I'll have to speak to him about that. Yeah, would I, you do that? Yeah. I'd certainly like to get that cleared up. But Doug, you're on that other committee too, so you you can definitely keep the communication open uh, about what's transpiring. And I don't know that. <laughs> The ATV UTV group was designed uh, to hoard all recreational activities for themselves. That's being done with other uh, other groups, and uh, we know that was the reason that this was formed in the very first place. Because nobody, you know, there wasn't a group around. Even snowmobilers, you know that they didn't want ATVs digging up their snow. So ATVs were kind of shut from every group in the county. They had nothing. And uh, now when they want to get something going and, and, and earn an effort to uh, to accomplish something uh, positive, and believe me, this is a growing industry that's going to be uh, overwhelming in this county uh, as it is in others. And the better we get control over it as an entity, and along with the safety programs and everything else that we've already been incorporating, I am building with the the basic idea. I think we'll better have a, have a better handle on on some of these problems that other areas are having. Just opening up trails and say, "Oh, come on in and start riding." You know, they're digging up roads. They're having bad accidents and things like that. And now we'll we're we're growing with the. Uh, with the program in such a manner that safety is one of the factors that's built into it from the origin. And so I think that we're, uh, we're on the right track. And uh, as far as sharing with the fat bikers or something, as long as they, they recognize that, uh, that they're, you know, they're not the, the owner of this trail, you know, everybody wants to come up. We understand that. But as long as we keep the organization going, uh, I don't think that the horse people want to run 25 miles up and then go back and load their horses up. You know, pretty heavy day. But uh, I don't know that we shouldn't just continue on and, and as they see the effort and the uh, achievements that are that I anticipate, that, you know, they'll they'll learn from what we're doing, hopefully, and, and build their own and build some own activities. So we can work with them, there's nothing wrong with that. 
wants to get going. No, he's not May I speak to that, Mr. Chair? <clears throat> At the uh, I, I also, you know, being on the uh, PTAG, uh, I, I got the impression at the last PTAG meeting that there were those there who, uh, who, who kind of thought they should be taking over this planning process for this uh, ATV uh, trail, this 25 mile loop that we're talking about here. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I didn't think that was quite right. I, you know, being under the impression that the PTAG was formed to more or less help with the uh, comprehensive outdoor recreation plan for the county, the big picture kind of stuff. And uh, knowing that the uh, uh, county's gonna be in the process of hiring somebody to put together a comprehensive trail network plan, uh, I, I think these things are gonna come into play. And it's still, I would have to say it's still early in the uh, formation of the PTAG committee and the ATPUTV committee, uh, I, I think there are a, a, a number of things that both of those committees and the administration are, are going to be growing into. So, uh, you know, will there be conflicts uh, or questions? You know, I, I, I think there will be, and, and you know, some of the groups might be, you know, happy about this or unhappy about that and, and how this is going. I, I, I do think that's the case. As we look at uh, the ATV UTV committee and uh, that community in particular, as you touched upon, uh, the importance of those things, especially to recreation in Northwest Wisconsin, is just expanding um, astronomically. And, and you know, if we look at any of the data associated with uh, uh, ATV, UTV sales and usage and, and that type of thing, uh, both, both nation, nationwide, statewide, but here in Wisconsin, in particular, Northwest Wisconsin, the, the numbers are almost mind boggling. So I, I, I think that we have a committee formed at this point in time to, to kind of enhance some of those recreational opportunities. I, you know, the, the, the timing is right as, as, as things are coming together for that. And also, you know, we look at that, that community in particular as uh, once again, being one of those more uh, self-funded communities. There may be, uh, large amounts of uh, money expended to uh, uh, create and maintain, you know, trails and trail systems. But that's, you know, one of the two communities out there, the other being snowmobile communities that fund virtually all of their own uh, development and maintenance. So to be at, I, I think, Polk County right now is positioned to be at the forefront of this type of thing. Great. Oh, I just one, the one comment I would would yeah. make is Doug can fill in for me, but yeah. if you create this with the state funding, then it can only be an ATV. Well, you can't add something to it. Can, whatever, I'll, pick anything. I can almost hear that we've got a great administration group in this county. I mean. They're, they're, they're pro county. And when you come up with these type of things and get something ready for development, I'm sure we'll have total cooperation with them and to, uh, to put it together properly. I'm confident in that. Yeah. But the staff has been very helpful. Yes. Well, there, I think about, two like years. you say, like Doug said, it's an infancy and we're growing with it. Yep. And, you know, Vince and Bob, I'm sure will will help us get this thing put together and and let the uh, supervisors understand what kind of, what the program consists of, what kind of adversities and things we do have, and we'll we'll get it accomplished. Man. I feel confident. Man. You guys are doing a heck of a job, you know, and that's uh, it's encouraging. I do see some outside areas and talk to a lot of people that around in this stuff and they are 
really uh, enthusiastic about what happened in Kansas. You're doing good. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just a comment. You know, one of the communication channels that should be included in their project is with the town. Just make Absolutely. sure the town's well informed. The yep. other communication they might want to do is is as these sections of trails that they develop and open uh, needs to be communicated to the fire local fire departments and first responders. And each section, in my opinion, should have its own title or name, and a map should be shared with the uh, people that need to respond, possibly out there to find somebody injured. Yep. Uh, so, you know, everybody's on the same page. Everybody knows where that section of trail is. They can go there, you know, rapidly and that type of thing. Absolutely. It could be a real asset in that respect, forest fire or anything. Uh, yep. that's yep. I, go ahead. Steve. Anything else? No, that's all I had. They're uh, they're apprised of what you've been talking about, and I think that'll be part of their uh, project for future for future um, meetings. Okay. Anything else? No, that's good. All right. Anybody else have anything? Questions? Hearing none, what's, what's the discussion on the conflict? On the conflict? Uh, at this point, we're kind of, there's not a lot to do to report other than we're kind of getting to the end of that initial discovery phase where I've been reaching out to organizations and people to get initial reactions. Yep. Uh, the latest being the Fair Board, or the Fair Society. Uh, we also, in later in April, have the uh, a municipal roundtable where we're inviting municipal leaders to come and just hear about the concept. And that's all this is at this point. We have, though, I've asked uh, our planner, Tim Anderson, to take a role in, in terms of developing now, which I think we'll have very shortly, kind of a phase timeline in which we see what types of information we need to collect next uh, to present to you all so that you have information to make the decision, do we start the next phase, which is we do a more intense market research effort to see what the demand is in the county, what the needs are uh, for any type of complex like this. And then the next phase will be, do we wanna continue and, and go with a, uh, for example, a, a consulting firm, which does these types of things all together. Uh, I will also be putting together kind of uh, a visual, uh, example of various sports and ag complexes around the country. Uh, there are some that, that I think might relate to what we have envisioned here, but at least it will be something to give you all an idea of what types of things we're talking about. Okay, Vince. Any questions on that? On this round table thing you're talking about, um, are the um, Administrators and chairs are going to be invited to that too? Yes, we historically invite uh, the, the villages, the city leaders, the town boards. We get a very low turnout. However, I can tell you I've had a few reach out to me already about this. They're interested in it. So we think we'll have a better turnout at this point. And, and we'll be able to discuss it and answer their questions. All right. Osceola Town is interested in an ordinance and breaking of uh, noise. Uh, who's going to address that? I'll address that. All right. I did email this to you. Um, but the town of Osceola has requested no engine breaking signs on County M. Yep. I'm going to deny and County Double M as you come down the hill heading north uh, past the Lotus Lake. Uh, housing development. Um, part of the requirements on that is that we don't have a uh, ordinance in place, so it's enforceable. Uh, the second part of that is uh, the installation of these. The town will pay for the installation of these. And once they're up, then the county maintains them as a sign on the county utility system. Um, but they are requesting this. Um, I did email this out Monday if you had a chance to see it on where the sign locations are. 
Um, and the engine braking is basically that loud noise that the semis make as they use their retarders to um, come down a hill, uh, disturbing residents. So what we're looking for is just a, a motion to approve the installation for this, and then I can move forward with ordering the signs and install them for the town. Do you need county approval? Being that it's on our system, oh. I'd like county uh, approval from the committee to make sure. Actually, it's all within the city. It's all within the town limits. You hear Chad up there? You hear him breaking? I can He never comes out front. That's okay. In your neighborhood is what I'm saying. Okay, well, that should be no problem, right? Well, do they want us to act on anything here? Just to potentially just a motion to approve the uh, installation of it. Joe will make that motion. Yep. Yeah. And uh second. All right, it's seconded by Steve, was it? Yep. Yeah. All right. Uh, to pass it out to the county board with our total approval. You need to go or you just. I think it just needs the committee approval from the highway committee. Oh, okay. All right, that's all we need. Then. All in favor? All in favor. All right. Opposed? Sit. I'm, all right, there was no. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thanks. Um, what do we got for fund twenty one work plan to add to it? I think is something we're uh, we got everything. You're you continuing on your program on a monthly basis, at least maybe more. So as far as the plan goes, nothing that we can add to it that I see. Do you have any ideas? Sure, I guess we should share uh, with COVID. Are you still going to be able to do the jail tour in July? Yeah, what? Yeah, I was just I, wondering with COVID if he's going to be able to do his jail tour in July or not. Yeah, I think we'll find a way to make it work. Okay. okay. But, and I don't want to deprive anybody of that fantastic meal. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Nothing else? How about the meeting for the next meeting that we have discussed? Need a motion to adjourn. So moved. By Joe, by Doug. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.